Anton Hellman here for the EM Cases podcast. This is episode 139, part three of our series on COVID-19. Now, the single most important thing we can do as ED providers in this COVID pandemic is to protect ourselves, our colleagues, our patients, our families, and our friends against transmission of the virus. And there's no higher risk of transmission than that during the resuscitation of a sick COVID patient. In this podcast, we'll be speaking with a world expert on PPE, Dr. Lori Mazurek, about protecting against transmission of the virus before, during, and after your shift. Not only will we discuss what is known about PPE from head protection down to footwear, but we'll give you tips on the equally important non-PPE protection as well. We'll touch on PPE conservation strategies as we struggle with supplies, give you the bottom line on donning, doffing, sequencing, and discuss the core principles of the protected code blue. We're privileged to have on the show during this COVID-19 crisis, a Toronto ED doc and disaster medicine expert. You might remember from our episodes on disaster medicine and the protected code blue, Dr. Lori Mazurek. Dr. Mazurek, welcome back to EM Cases. Can you just tell our listeners a little bit about your background when it comes to PPE? Yeah. In 2003, I was a member of the Provincial SARS Operations Centre. And from that vantage point, you could see the importance of personal protective equipment. I think all of us who were healthcare providers at that time, our biggest fear was bringing that virus home and actually transmitting it to our family. So we were highly motivated to stay safe. And yet, despite wearing PPE, we found ourselves catching the disease, much to our chagrin and fear. So Since that time, I've been highly motivated, spent time on international teams to develop standards with regards to personal protective equipment in healthcare. Great. So let's start with how the EM provider can protect themselves, their patients, their colleagues, and their families. But I'd like to break it down into before your shift, during your shift, and after your shift. Let's get the simple ones out of the way first, which is the before your shift and after your shift. How do you suggest we protect ourselves from COVID-19 before we do our shift and then afterwards? Well, there's always how do you get to work and should you use public transit? Probably if you can go by private transit, that's safer. You also have to prepare yourself mentally for going into an environment where there may be COVID-19 patients. So mentally rehearse the activities in which you're going to be asked to do. So if you're in a COVID assessment clinic, that will be different than seeing non-COVID patients the PPE, what you're going to use in different circumstances, and just get ready mentally for the donning and doffing of the PPE equipment. So what can you do before and after your shift to minimize transmission? Now, this might sound like overkill, but ER providers really, really need to stay healthy if or when REDs are overwhelmed by COVID patients. So here are some tips. One, remove jewelry and watches. Next, obtain clean scrubs at the hospital if possible. Place all your work gear, stethoscope, pens, phone, clipboard, etc. into a freezer Ziploc bag. Use a separate pair of waterproof shoes that you leave at work. Take an extra large freezer bag or garbage bag to place your clothes into. Take with you some disinfectant wipes or if they've run out in your community, mix 25 milliliters of bleach in 750 milliliters of water. Make sure you label the bottle. Put it in a a spray bottle so that you can wipe down your car, steering wheel, gear shift, seat, etc. After your shift, if possible, shower at the hospital, leaving your scrubs there or place them in a separate freezer bag and change into the clothes that you kept in the freezer bag. If there's no shower at the hospital, wash your hands, arms, and face with soap. Change from your hospital shoes into your home shoes. Sanitize your badge and phone and place all your gear back into the freezer bag. When you get home, leave your gear in the garage or shed or under a bucket outside. If you are going to take a water bottle or a food container, which you probably shouldn't, but if you are, put it directly into the dishwasher and put your clothes into the washing machine using hot water. Finally, take a shower. Those are all options, I think. But the most important thing is you want to get rid of the things you might normally wear. So any kind of jewelry, even just the lanyard on your ID tag, which is often cloth, that's a magnet for absorbing things. So can you go to some sort of nylon? Thinking of anything that a virus might stick to, make sure it's not part of what you wear. Make sure that you eat before you come. Try to limit the amount of 
eating that you have to do at work or beverages that you might take in, those kinds of things. You have to take breaks for sure, but make sure you have your own safe food supply that you've sort of been handling, that you're the one that's looking after it. Those are the kinds of things I think you want to think about before you get there. So no public transit, if you can avoid it, leaving everything at home that doesn't need to be there, and having your own food and nutrition supply so you look after it, know that nobody else has touched it. It's your kind of responsibility to take care of not spreading and not contracting the disease. So that's a little bit about how to protect against COVID-19 before and after your shift. Let's move on to protecting yourself, your colleagues, and your patients during your shift. So we first need to understand a little bit about the general principles of PPE. So can you just run through for us those general principles of personal protective equipment? Isolating certainly the person that has symptoms and isolating them quickly and giving them a surgical mask. Making sure once they're in the room, you don't need to go in the room to interview them, especially if they're well, and most of these people are. Get their cell phone number, call them, do the full screen and history and everything you need to do outside the room so that there's no reason really whatsoever for you to go in. And only after you've done your full assessment and history um, do you decide what your plan of action is going to be. If they do need to be swabbed, who's going to do it? Do you have to go in and do an assessment and then the nurse goes in and does the swab? That's two people exposed. Think about that. I think really only one person should go in, do the assessment and do the swabs. And then decisions about follow-up and self-isolation should be undertaken. I will say one thing about the mid-turbinate swab. You might think that they don't cough and that this is not aerosol generating. However, having done one of these things, Foolishly just stuck it in someone's nose, thinking that it would be fine, only to be coughed over far more than I ever anticipated and to feel incredibly uncomfortable that I'd been highly exposed. So lesson learned for a silly doctor who doesn't do this normally. Stand beside or slightly behind the patient, warn them that you're going to do this. And if they have the urge to cough, to put their mask up and turn away from you so that at least the the cough that might be coming out isn't directed to you. So I think those are some important lessons. Absolutely. Don't go in until you have to. Maybe you don't have to at all. And when you do go in, make sure you don't create a situation that multiple people have to go in and do the same thing. So if you as the physician or the nurse can go in, do the assessment, come out and uh, do the swab at the same time and spare one person from being exposed, that's what you should do. It could be a physician assistance too as well. They're in many places, that's who's doing these types of assessments. All right. Those are some great practical tips. When it comes to the unstable patient, we'll get to that when we talk about the protected controlled intubation. So there's different levels of PPE. There's going to be the hypoxic patient who obviously needs to be immediately isolated and you're donning full PPE. Um, Let's talk about the gear in particular and the different levels of PPE. So can you go through for us the different levels of PPE and what gear they require? Yeah, well, let's get a few things out of the way right away. I'll leave the mask, the N95 versus the surgical mask last, because that is the biggest, I guess, form of protection that we have. And there's controversy over it as to what you should use when, and we are going to run out, so it may all become a moot point anyway. So we'll save that to last. So let's start with simple things. Gloves. Which gloves should you wear? Obviously, we shouldn't be wearing latex because you're going to get allergies. Nitrile. Sometimes... If you need to have extended nitriles because your gowns are short, you have to think about that, but they are in short supply. So really preserve those for situations where you need to have extended nitriles, usually in a situation of intubation or high viral load type of patient. Secondly, gowns are not all the same. If you have a gown that you can hold up, it's called a procedure gown and it's yellow and you can see through it. That is not protection for you. And a lot of places use a gown, but they don't specify what type of gown. You need a gown that at minimum is is level two, so it gives you some barrier to the virus. Um, Definitely nothing that you can see through. In China, they use higher levels, probably because they had very high viral loads and lots of patients around. And what happens as you you go from uh, porous, like see-through, to somewhat impervious or fluid resistant, which is probably what we're using. We would use level two gowns that are reusable. Level three and four moves up to the waterproof gown, which you probably don't need. And we won't have anyway, so we'll run out. So look for reusable, washable gowns. 
The other thing is gowns are definitely not all the same in their coverage. If you go and look, you'll see that many gowns are procedure gowns and they cover only the front, sort of like an apron with sleeves. That gives you no protection to the back. So again, coming back to the reusable, washable yellow gowns, I think those are your best bet. If you can get them, get them. Next is face shields. Well, there's a lot of face shields. Some are reusable, some are not. This turned out to be a very beneficial form of protection. Why? Because it wraps around your face and protects your mask and your eyes, your nose and your mouth. So in certain parts of China where they did run out of PPE, specifically N95s, they were concerned about using surgical masks because they experienced SARS like nobody else in 2003. So they're very sensitive to protecting their healthcare workers. However, when you don't have things, you do what you can. With face shields, they did swab underneath the face shield and found that actually if you had a face shield on, there was very little contamination of your face or the mask. And so suddenly you had a level of protection that people had taken for granted or didn't think was that important that actually provided significant protection. So think about your face shields. There's no question. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. We throw away these little flimsy face shields. It would be nice if IPAC or engineers or somebody could think about how to use the the shield itself. We can't really use the foam and the attachments thing, but we might have to find a way to use that. There are cleanable reusable shields too as well. And maybe we have to think about that. The protection added to that is a lot more than what was expected. Using a combination of goggles and face shields or glasses and face shields tends to fog. There is an advantage of having glasses on. However, even if you wear a face shield, eventually you're going to take it off and the, the portals to infecting you are through first one through your respiratory tract, so your mouth, your nose, and then also through your eyes. So if you have glasses, just like wearing a surgical mask, you can't really touch your eyes readily. So there's a protection that way, not so much from spray or splash, although that's there too as well, but more you tend to rub your eyes while you will think twice about it when you hit your glasses. Apparently we touch our face up to 2,000 times a day, so having barriers to us Doing what we normally do through muscle memory, which is touch our face, will be protective too as well. However, combining the two gets a little tenuous. So if you are going to use a face shield and you don't normally wear glasses and you want to get some glasses put on your face shield for that reason, get the smallest ones you can that don't cross a lot of fogging, not these sort of industrial vented things, and try a couple of things. They might be sort of sport glasses. Okay, so we've talked about gowns, gloves, eye protection, face shields. What about head protection? Yeah, it's an interesting question because it's not currently recommended by WHO, they say, or CDC. They say, you know, it's okay to use it, but they don't necessarily recommend it. I did um, training of something like 30 to 35 physicians on doing intubation. Some were wore a surgical bouffant and some did not. At the end of the uh, training, I would blow just a smidgen of glow germ, which is a, a fluorescent dust at them, to see where it would go. And what we found was it did definitely went to your neck. And it, if you didn't wear a bouffant, it went to the side of your, your ears and into your hair. So it's worth it. It's a very readily available piece of equipment. I would recommend it. It does give you some protection. There was the concern about doffing it. Are you going to self-contaminate? Well, I had every one of these guys doff it to see the degree of self-contamination. And it was negligible. And certainly because they all had to wash their hands uh, before they removed their mask, there was none on their hands from their bouffant uh, when they took off their surgical or N95 mask. So it's a cheap form of protection. The second part is, well, what do you do about your neck? You don't have necessarily hoods. Uh, we did find that you did get contamination of your neck. So two things you can do to help reduce that. You can make sure your gown is tied up high to cover as much of your neck as possible. And then secondly, after you finish doffing, think about actually cleaning your neck with hand sanitizer or soap and water. And if you do think you actually had a significant breach or somebody witnessed a significant breach, do all that, but then go somewhere where you can shower, uh, get rid of your greens and put new greens on. All right. So that's a little bit about head and neck. Uh, what about shoe covers? You know, one option is just to have your shoes at work that are separate from shoes outside of work. Is that adequate or do we need shoe covers as well? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. All of us are on social media and we can see what the Chinese were wearing at the height of the problems at Wuhan. I think you have to think when you look at that, they were basically walking in a field of uh, of corona uh, virus. So they probably had reasons for doing that. I think um, when you look at the literature, the transmission through fomites or from particles on the floor is quite low. Is, is it zero? Probably not. But how many times are people going to pick up your shoes and actually touch it and go, touch the bottom of your shoe and take it up to your nose, your face, or your mouth? You're supposed to do strict hand washing. So I think the simplest thing is shoe covers is just more medical waste that gets covered with virus that I'm not sure we should or should not be using. So I personally feel at this point, no, I think it is a good idea to leave your shoes at work and how should you decontaminate them after you've been in a COVID sort of area uh, is a is the good question. I think IPAC should be charged with that responsibility. They want to own the responsibility of environmental control. I do know that people can walk through what they call shuffle pits, so pads that have bleach on them that would decontaminate the soles of their shoes. But again, IPAC would have to look at that and base it on what they believe the viral load is in the environment. Certainly Wuhan, they had a high viral load, so probably what they did was justified. I'd, at this point, I don't think it's something we should do. Like everything else may change, the recommendations may change. All right. So we've talked a little bit about all the gear except for the mask, which is the most contentious issue. Um, let's talk about the masks and then we can specifically talk about the different levels of PPE and which levels are required for which patients. Yeah, it uh, it is a contentious issue. And in both Ontario and B.C., uh, because I think there were people in both of those provinces who had significant experience with SARS from 2003, there was the need to feel protected and so adopted the N95 as what we should all be wearing. I think over time it, it was recognized that we were going to run out of PPE and then, you know, were we going to have the N95s for what we really know to be high risk? And I think that's probably what led to a downgrading of those provinces to align with other areas, including uh, the you know CDC or WHO. The good news is there's always there's a silver lining and there's there isn't, is that the um, surgical mask has definitely got protective value. It was, however, just to be clear, never developed to protect the person wearing it. It was always developed to protect others from the person wearing it. So if I was doing a surgical procedure and I happened to cough or have a cold, I wouldn't transmit it. So we know that it's extremely good for containing transmission. So in that sense, if a healthcare worker is an asymptomatic uh, carrier, that will be contained. The other thing is we know we touch our face and our nose and mouths, especially, and those are the main portals of access for the virus. It blocks that. We don't touch those uh, areas, or even if we touch those areas, we touch the masks that blocks the transmission there. So if you think about that, if droplets are the main way in which you catch the disease, then there's for sure there's protection there. If you add eye protection and a face shield, you actually have quite good protection there. So I think in that sense, we are safe in that regard. There's still the issue of how is the virus transmitted to healthcare workers and why are we three times as likely to catch the disease than others? Well, clearly because we have people coming to us with the virus, we are in close proximity to them and they carry the people coming to us will have higher viral loads. So it's trying to identify what's called a super spreader. So, and that is a heterogeneous group, meaning that you can have a healthy person like the one in Italy who started the whole thing, a healthy soccer player, was out running with the team, doing all these types of things. Yet it turns out he's a super spreader. So if you're really healthy and strong, you could still have a high viral load. And then there are the ones that are very weak and need intubation. They're, they, they may not always be super spreaders, but they certainly have a high viral load. And we tend to take the precautions, take them more seriously, take the precautions, and so subsequently limit the spread. So what do you need? Well, any kind of aerosol generation, and this is where the N95 does play a critical role. So if you have a small particle, so droplets are generally somewhere around 10 microns, when you start to get less than three microns, uh, you can start to inhale these 
viruses, and that puts you at the highest risk. So without a doubt, anything that generates a droplet nuclei of that size that can be inhaled. So if you think about mucus around the virus and then something shears off that mucus and makes it small, you could potentially inhale it. If you can inhale that virus, your chances of getting infected go up dramatically. And I think that's where healthcare workers run into the risk. We are within that one meter space. These patients are coughing and we do procedures that generate aerosols. So anything that generates an aerosol is likely to create droplet nuclei small enough to be inhaled and you really do need airborne protection under that circumstance. So they've identified clearly uh, intubation being the highest risks. And I think we need to probably reflect on that, why that is, because now we're paralyzing them. They're not coughing. So why is it such high risk? Most likely it's an extremely high viral load. And we're doing aerosol generating procedures that put us at risk. So if we're bagging one person or not having tight seals, those types of things, or, or being delayed in our paralytic administration, those are the kinds of things that will take a high viral load make a bunch of particles that are anybody within that sort of one meter or even two meter space is going to be at risk. So if you are in that situation, you 100% need an N95. Where the challenge is now coming in is, what do we do if we don't have ventilators and we have to start thinking about non-invasive ventilation that could be associated with creating aerosols? So in uh, Italy, they've got the the helmet CPAP, which is like basically like having CPAP within a plastic bag, so it has some environmental control. We don't have anything like that. We don't know if high flow nasal cannula, which go at about sixty liters a minute, we know that's going to generate aerosols. We're not quite sure how do we protect ourselves against that. Certainly, limiting the time you are with that patient. So time exposed is a is a risk factor. The amount you're exposed to, those are two risk factors. And the barriers you have to protect you from inhaling those things or is the is the part of the side like it protects you from getting the disease. In the meantime, if you're going to do with anything aerosol generating, first of all, ask yourself, do I have to do it? And secondly, if you don't if you do have to do it, like it's intubation, et cetera, you wear an N95 and anybody else who's in that room with you wears an N95. Okay, so the bottom line there is that anything that's potentially aerosol producing N95, everything else, a surgical mask is adequate. With the proviso, if they are coughing and you're not doing aerosol generating, I would definitely have a face shield or something like that to give you that sort of protection. Got it. We're going to have videos of donning and doffing for PPE on the show notes, but could you just go through for us quickly the sequence of donning and doffing? Yeah. Well, it's hard to do just verbally. It's something you have to practice. This is muscle memory, right? So just me talking is definitely not making you competent. And if anybody hasn't been practicing this yet, then they shouldn't. They've kind of missed a few opportunities to inquire their skills. So it's like everything else. Make sure you are just in your greens. You don't have any unnecessary jewelry, et cetera, uh, that could potentially trap the virus, take your land dirt off and whatever else that might is unnecessary for you to do your job. Make sure you hand wash. Um, and then the it, it, question is, what are you going to be doing next? So most people, it's every IPAC is slightly different in terms of their approach. So you have to be aware of that and you need to study your local sort of recommendations. I think the first thing is really to put your mask on. Then your uh, if you have an N95, the reason for putting your mask on first is that you can do the seal check. So don't put your gloves on before you do your seal check because it's hard to feel a leak with your hands that are gloved. Second would be the gown and then the gloves, the gloves with the cuff, uh, over the cuff. Um, then if you're going to use a bouffant, put a bouffant on and then your face shield or eye protection. And those would be the most common sort of steps. Okay. And then in terms of doffing? Yeah. So you always want to take off your dirtiest piece of equipment first. And that may vary depending on what you have just done. So if you were, say, doing a central line and you got blood on you, it, it, you know, certainly it might be your gloves, but then it might be your gown too as well. So you have to think about that. The simple rule is this, your mask is always last. So always think about as your, you have cardiac box for trauma, that's a real high risk zone. Think about respiratory box. So basically eyes, nose, and mouth, anything that's on that area protecting it, take it off last. So first on, last off, mask, first on, mask last off. That's a great principle to remember in case you get confused. <laughs> 
So really the only hard rules that you have to remember for PPE donning and doffing is the mask should always be first on and last off and take your dirtiest PPE off first. Let's talk a little bit about environmental control. In particular, what do you do about computer keyboards? You know, we use these computer keyboards in the emergency department all the time. How do you keep them free of virus? Yeah, we need some sort of wipes, like uh, the anti, I suppose, antibacterial, antiviral wipes to at least do the keyboards. Probably trying to keep, uh, if you have a spot that's your spot, maybe make it your spot so you can sort of have a little bit of ownership. That's not always possible, and there's a lot of shared spaces, but I do think that... You know, as a courtesy, after you've used something, maybe you can clean the keyboard, make a rule that that last person touched it, cleans it, so the next person coming on doesn't have to be worried about it. Or if you're worried about it, you're just cleaning it when you get on it, and you're also cleaning it when you got off it. Challenges with that is, are we going to run out of wipes? And anything like this is possible. So we have to think about that. So if that's the case, then do we go to two gloves system so that... Meaning um, you have one pair of gloves that we essentially wear all the time, and then between patients you change gloves, which is what we did during SARS. Part of the benefit of that is one, you touch the keyboards and they are contaminated. Well, they're not actually making contact with your skin. The second part is if you are doing washing and washing and washing of your hands, you for sure are going to start to break down your skin barrier. It will crack. Uh, you might get bleeding. You may actually putting yourself at increase chance of sort of an unusual way of catching the disease, but certainly not impossible, of the virus sort of creeping in through cracks and breaks in your skin. So I think that we have to consider that that might be a possibility. We might end up going to two gloves simply to preserve our skin. And because we have a little bit of challenges with environmental control, again, you got to talk to your IPAC, ask these questions to them. What is their plan to keep us safe and keep our environment clean? And you even suggest some of these things to see what kind of answers they have. All right. Double gloves is a great idea. You're not wasting too much resource there because you're just going to have the the gloves that are closest to your skin you're going to be wearing for the entire shift. Yeah. And you can wash the gloves. I mean, you just consider it your second skin and away you go. Hand sanitize your hands with your gloves. Excellent tip. Let's move on to the protected code blue and resuscitating the patient with suspected COVID-19. Well, actually resuscitating any patient in the ED during the COVID outbreak. Since you had a leading role during SARS, can you give us a bit of background on the protected code blue? The transmission of SARS in 2003 to physicians, clinicians, nurses, RTs, and anybody else in the room at when the intubation was occurring was remarkable in the sense that almost 10% of people were catching the virus by doing this procedure and in instances, in most cases, were wearing the recommended PPE. So it became obvious to us that this isn't just about PPE and wearing PPE. This isn't breaches of PPE, because that by this point, we probably knew what we were doing. But this is something wrong in what we were doing, not just the PPE. So in one case, and I won't say where, there were six people infected by one patient, during the intubation, and three people who just walked through the room sometime shortly afterwards. So nine people from one patient became infected. And this was in Toronto. Uh, This was very close to home and incentivized, let's say, a number of us to look at practice within a simulated workspace. So I looked at what is the existing PPE that could really protect us. We reached out to uh, intensivists in Hong Kong who at this point had actually figured out uh, many of the aspects that would protect us. So the Protected Code Blue came up with some a number of principles that we can't adopt entirely for this COVID-19, but we can adopt many of them. Probably the most important ones are the limit, the number of people in the room. You want to not have everybody in there, learners in there, because they're going to catch it if you aren't careful. So the most experienced intubator, you'll need one nurse and probably an RT. Do you need more? If you need more, put them outside the room in PPE ready to go. Actually, don't have their N95s on simply because we can't have everybody just have N95s on. Maybe they're going to get called in. So just have it ready to go if you need it. If you need help, you call, they come in. But until that point, they don't. Practice and rehearse what you're going to do. Have a 
literally algorithmic approach, bang, 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 of what you're going to do. And before you intubate, always avoid aerosol generation if you can. You can't always, but do what you can to do that. So the biggest learner lesson with this was intubate early before they lost their apneic reserve. Paralyze unless there is a contraindication. That it immediately puts the patient in the best sort of intubating conditions and prevents coughing. If you absolutely have to do BVM, you do it two-person. With a tight seal, someone fo totally uh, focused on the seal. Finally, if you're coming into a cardiac arrest, it's no longer CAB. It's ABCs. It's A because you need to secure that airway in order to protect the team. It's all about team in this. Protect the team, intubate the airway, go on to the rest. Excellent. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that when we speak to George Kovacs about uh, airway. Now, this is all fine and dandy when it comes to PPE in terms of ideally what we should be doing. But of course, we've heard from all over the world that there's limited supplies of PPE. Do you have any strategies that you can suggest in light of these limited resources? You don't wait till you have no PPE decide you need to do something about it. Use PPE as long as you can before you change it. So if you have a surgical mask, you wear it until, like, start at the shift, try to wear it for the entire shift if you can, changing it only if it gets contaminated or wet. And so it really, uh, the, the protective value is lost. If you have an N95, use it the same way. We did this during SARS. It was uncomfortable, but it's doable. And you can salvage the PPE and keep it going as long as possible. Some of the innovative things that are being talked about in forums, what we really need is the experts on this, the scientists to look at it, is does UV light work? Does microwaving work? There are eMERGE docs out there microwaving their, their mask, which sounds like, you know, you probably would cook a virus, but do you cook a virus? Maybe we should find out what happens to the mask if you do that and whether, in fact, you do return it, restore it to some sort of function that's reusable. CDC is apparently saying, well, when you run out, use a bandana. I don't think that's what we should be doing. There are better options. And we should, what we should be doing is looking at unusual sort of sources of ingenuity. Get people who really know their stuff, like military or industrial designers of these masks, who can tell you what you need is a woven fabric that gives you multiple layers to trap things. So a bandana, probably not so good, but maybe quilting would be what we need to look at. I'm not saying I have the answers, but I'm saying there's a lot of people looking at it. We should never dismiss ideas, no matter how novel or unusual they seem to be. They may, in fact, be the solutions. So uh, be prepared for expecting the unexpected, but I do think a solution will emerge and we have to be open, open-minded open enough to think that uh, we don't always have to have CDC approved. We don't always have to have NIOSH approved. That would be nice, but the original idea may come from somewhere else. All right. So people are working on it. For now, I think one of the most important things we can do is to continue to use the mask that we're wearing until it becomes obviously contaminated, wet, if someone coughs on it, if you're doing an intubation with it, et cetera. So, yeah, if you're, in, if you're definitely using it for any kind of high-risk procedure, a patient with a high viral load, that mask is toast. So, But it's the in-between kind of uh, patients uh, that probably don't have a high viral load. Use it for as long as you can. I will say this. We, I think that probably now, uh, I, what I'm going to do personally, it's not a recommendation the world do it or anything. I'm probably going to use my surgical mask on at all times. Because I feel that there probably is a lot of asymptomatic carriers, I'm going to be exposed to them on a regular basis. And it probably will save PPE because if I only use it for the one that I suspect, well, I'm going to toss it. Whereas if I just wear it the whole day, I maybe use one and I can see five of those guys. So it actually ends up saving PPE. So just a little update on March 26 of some PPE conservation strategies. And just to review a little bit. Again, there is a global shortage of PPE and strategies are being developed to preserve, use longer, and reuse PPE. For example, as we talked about, staff are asked to use a single mask or N95 respirator for as long as possible, changing it only if it gets wet or contaminated. Using washable, reusable gowns, face shields, glasses, and goggles are also part of this conservation strategy. Now, some new things are that some manufacturers are actually retooling to make PPE. For example, Bauer hockey equipment are making face shields. There's 
using industrial protective equipment, so cleanable and reusable face shields from big box hardware stores, for example. In terms of DIY masks, Cambridge University has an analysis of the materials to filter for viruses, which we'll have in the show notes. The important part being that quilted materials may be best as they're breathable and the mesh of fibers is better than one layer. There's also a CDC guide for extended use of N95 masks, which we'll have the link to on the show notes. And finally, Stanford has done some research indicating that putting an N95 mask in a conventional oven at 70 degrees Celsius or 158 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes should be effective in killing the SARS-CoV-2 and does not degrade the mask itself. Any last words of wisdom, Dr. Masaryk, uh, when it comes to PPE, the protected code blue, protecting ourselves, our colleagues, our families, and our patients during this crisis? Well, expect the unexpected. And I think I feel very strongly, too, as well, of what I would call this culture of safety. We all have each other's uh, back, and we should all be feeling that we have the right to speak up about ways to do things better, and that this is really how we're going to contribute to the greater good. Thank you so much for your expertise and your insights. One of the most important aspects of preparing for the tsunami, if or when it hits your ED, is to practice, 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 train, train, train. Now, if you only have one week to train all your ED docs on PPE and intubation and the protected code blue, then you don't have time to run dozens of sims. The solution to this can be found in the show notes for this episode, where we'll have an instructor's manual and course guide, as well as illustrative videos on a brilliant rapid cycling procedures course specifically designed for COVID and specifically designed to train providers quickly. The guide and instructor's manual are free, thanks to the amazing work of Dr. Chris Kiefer. So please take advantage of this opportunity before the tsunami of COVID patients needing intubation hits your ED. The next EM Cases COVID podcast, which will be released a day or two after this one, is with George Kovacs, Canada's airway legend, and that'll be on COVID airway resuscitation strategies. We've also released an EM Quick Hits with five-minute segments of your colleagues sharing their experiences in the COVID area with some practical tips, and a second EM Quick Hits will be released the week of March 30th. Finally, Weekly updates from Dr. Masaryk, Dr. Morris, and Dr. Kovacs will appear in your inbox if you've signed up for the EM Cases newsletter and will be replicated on the EM Cases website. Just click on COVID-19 in the navigation bar. So until next time, stay safe, be strong, and know that we're all in this together.